Thanks, everyone. Good to, good to see you all, those of you I can see. Um, anyway, uh, uh, this is uh, the next, uh, next class of this type. Um, I don't know about you if you've, if you've seen several of them, but I'm actually uh, really liking this as an activity because uh, I, think, I think where I came from, you just practice. Like you, it's not important to watch videos or anything, but... Uh, you know, I, now that I'm looking at them all, it, there's a lot of value to it. So uh, who knows, we might come out of this uh, understanding Aikido better. So when we start practicing again, we'll have some real insight that we, that we got from these sessions. So um, uh, I want to thank everyone who sent in uh, comments and feedback on either the podcast or this or the classes. Uh, it's just very, very helpful when people give us feedback because this is all new territory, obviously, for us, and we're trying to do something that uh, is is responsive to what, what people want and need, and I think we're all discovering what that might be. So it's just very helpful for us, anyway, to produce this, to have feedback. Um, and... Um, with, so we can uh, move on into the first video. So this first video is, um, is a video of O-sensei doing a demonstration in 1935. So he's about, I guess, about 50 years old here. And um, this is in the category of Aikido videos are just fun to watch. Uh, it's just, a, you'll see, it's amazing what he's doing. Um, there's uh, been a little uh, debate about this uh, this film. Um, it was shot on Super 8, and so there's always a question of calibration when you when you play it back, and is it being played back too fast or too slow? Recently, somebody came out with one, and if you look on YouTube, you'll see different versions of it. One says the correct time, but I actually think that guy made it too slow. So uh, this might be a little fast, but I think this is closer than the one that's called slow. He was sort of just debunking, you know, the thing by saying, ah, it was too fast. But um, so there's different versions. This is, this is sort of a 10 minute version. I'm going to stop it halfway through, but uh, this is a 10 minute version. I think the whole thing is about 14 minutes, but uh, this is uh, most of the good parts. Um, so uh, just, uh, you know, check out how O-sensei moves and how he, He's so fluid with coming up with the techniques and, uh, you know, I find it amazing. So uh, anyway, like I say, I'll play about half of it and stop. It's like dramatic music. I'll turn it down. So you can see this is before uh, they had O-sensei's picture up, obviously. So that was the Kamiza. Everybody's very well ordered here. Sharada Sensei became a major teacher. He 
Yonakawa. There were three the Yonakawa, there were three UKs. He was one of them. You can see these guys are sort of taking breakfalls. Uh, Aikido Zukemi also went through stages, I believe. These guys were in the good, these were good. Hosensei has no pants on under his hakama. Ikionage. I'm not sure what that is. Eh? Ikyo, right, with a different pin. Nikyo or Rokyo as we call it. Iriminage, Chokusen. Karita Sensei does Iriminage that way. Kodagaish Urawaza, uh, Hitoi Riminage. Sometimes we do those 2K techniques. Okay, I'll, I'm just gonna stop it there. I mean, that's like, for an Aikidoist, watching that is like uh, snorting crack or something, or whatever you do with crack. Um, so um, you, you can see the way the guy moves and the rapidity with which he can come up with techniques is incredible um and um uh you can see how the as the techniques got uh, uh codified uh they became a little more distinct so uh at that time there were a mixture of sort of pins and different techniques sometimes he didn't do a pin so uh the different one of the differences from what we do now is um has to do with that that um uh, I think towards the end of Osensei's life, but more when the second Doshu, Kishomaro Doshu was was in charge after Osensei passed away. Um, that's a period in which the, the, the techniques got more crystallized in terms of uh, defining forms that were considered basic and, and, and things like that. Um, so th this is very free flowing. Um, anyway, anybody have any uh, questions about this? Sensei, this is Ricky. Uh, so when O Sensei uh, moved like in, it seems like he's anticipating the attack and almost directing what he wants the attack to be. I is that what he's doing? Yeah, you know, there's the thing in, in martial arts of the three timings: uh, sen no sen, uh, sen sen no sen, and I forget what the other one is. <laughs> Yuto, you can help me remember it, but so it's basically early timing the simultaneous timing and the late timing. And Osensei was sort of, many people have uh, commented that Osensei did the early timing. So he had a way of, uh, of moving or, or a lot of times you'll see, uh, I think it was in the Swariwaza part, he'll stick, he'll stick his hand up in the Uke's face, like almost, it's like Shomenuchi. 
and make them block it and then do the technique. So I think that, I think that uh, Osensei, uh, well, I think he said that he could, he could see the people's movement before they did it. And uh, um, I, I think that kind of happens where, we're, you know, with someone like that, you can read the movements. I think the more, you, you know, as you practice for a long time, you, you, you pick up more subtle cues in people's movements. I think you get uh, better at um, anticipating how people are going to move. But I think he was just very good at that. And so combination of using an early timing, which lets, you know, which makes the UK react in some way. And um, uh, his sense of how people were going to move. And just this, he had this, uh, I don't know, he had, uh, he had the Kavorka, you know, uh, and uh, uh, he, he just was always moving into the right place. And uh, I think he could do it like before they physically moved a lot of the time. Sensei. Any other questions on that part? Uh, Sensei, I just had a question. Um, do you know what kind of mat technology they had? I mean, that looks like, I'm going to guess that's tatami, but do you know if they had any kind of subflooring or anything underneath that? I don't know. I, the, the, the judo people were the ones that started with subflooring, but I don't know the history of it. And I don't know when it started. I'm guessing that that is not, there is no subflooring. I don't know. I, I, we, I suppose we could watch it when they hit and see how much it moves, but uh, it looks like it's tatami. But remember like traditional tatami is like made out of straw, not like the nice synthetic tatami we have now. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if those are harder. My sense is they're harder. Um, I don't know what kind of floors they built under. I'm not sure if at that point they were, they were, uh, designing floors. Yeah. It just, it's, yeah, it seems like the, uh, the Okemi would be a lot, be a lot harder to take the, the break falls on a floor like that. At least over yeah, I think these guys were tough. I think these guys were tough. And, um, uh, so Shirada, Shirada was there, Shirada sensei. And where they say Yonakawa, there was another guy called Akazawa, I think. And a third guy whose name I can't remember, and um, they were they were his senior students at that time. And I'm not sure if it's just because of this film that I I know who they are. One of them actually got killed in a in a in a bar. Um, I don't know if I have the story right, but the version I heard was that he you know he'd gotten into a fight with someone, beaten them up, and then the guy came into a bar and just sort of sidled up to him and just knifed him uh, in the bar, and he died. And uh, so that would have been um, one of Osensei's best students. But you can see, you know, it, it, <laughs> what you learn from it is, you know, everybody is dangerous. And, uh, you know, uh, you, in martial arts, you can never take people for granted. Like somebody who has the strong intent to hurt you, that's a very powerful technique. And, uh, you know, that, that was horrible, but that's just the way, obviously, he couldn't have... Uh, you know, killed him fighting straight on, but we did it that way. But, you know, that's how, that's how fighting works, right? That's how war works or, or, or state of fighting. Um, but it's tragic, you know, in another way, because this guy must've been really good. Um, the, these other, the, the other two though, that, that did live, I never heard of them as teachers. So I don't know really what happened to them. I don't know that history, but uh, as I said, Shirata sensei became a major teacher and he was very close to, um, Akira Tohei Sensei, who taught in Chicago for many years uh, at the Midwest Aikido Center, and who's the teacher of Joe Birdsong, who you guys know. Um, so he was definitely around. He passed away, uh, not sure how long ago, but in his 90s or something. Uh, so he's passed away now. But uh, yeah, he was the one that sort of I know about anyways, having gone on. Any other questions about that part? I was wondering about the way he was moving. We've been discussing in class that in sword work, especially you should try and walk on the heels of your feet. On the, um, on the, seems like on the, on the, on the balls of your feet. On the balls of your feet. Okay. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Okay, good. Yeah. So martial arts, you're supposed to be walking on the serve sort of on the balls of your feet. So your toes are supposed to be pointed straight or even slightly in. Um, and your weight should be sort of on the ball, so the front inside of the foot. 
in Iaido that gets emphasized because in Iaido when you do like shohato, the feet very you're explicitly taught to use the inside edge of your feet to push out. And so the, the weight is mostly on the ball, but sort of on the whole inside of the foot. And by that way you get traction. So when you're making that cut, Nukitsuke, uh, you're very solid. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what they do in other martial arts, but yeah, essentially you're supposed to be walking on the balls of your feet. Um, uh, so that's the front uh, inside. One time Arakawa Sensei at summer camp had a whole class teaching people how to walk. Uh, I forget what, what he said though. So, <laughs> but anyway, so it's, I guess it's serious. The sensei, oh, oh, sensei seems to have taken a series of small steps as he's moving around before he would commit it to what he was doing sort of in, in free form. Yeah. He, yeah, he has those little, he's taking those little steps. It's like really weird, right? What is that? Uh, I just think that was that was like his movement, and I think that um, the, the, actually the interesting thing, and if we watch the rest of this, you'll see some great examples. He, even though he was sort of like you know hop, you know sort of skipping around that way with those little steps, when he finally lands and when he finally throws, he's like really solid. He like comes down and plants in a moment. Yeah, he just decides right and say that this is it, and then the little yeah. stuff stops and boom. Yeah, so okay. I think part of the amazing thing is is that uh, he could transition from being so light-footed, so light on his feet, and then coming down in very stable positions at a moment. And um, actually, uh, I don't know, I'm going to ask you if you want to go on with this or get to work. Um, uh, but uh, later on, you'll see some great examples where you can really see he's standing in Toitsu Tai when he throws. Thank you, Sensei. Anybody else? All right, well, let's watch the rest. Okay. So that's like a kind of yankyo. It's a hiji dobe kokyunage. That hitoe riminage. Tomer sensei used to do that technique. This was one of his specialties. <laughs> I mean, these UKs are really crowding him and he has no trouble getting the techniques off. So this is a wooden rifle with bayonet. So obviously 1935, Japan was involved in a big war in uh, China. Um, so I'm sure that had to do with partially with why they did it this way. Um, but it's the same techniques as Joe. That's, uh, Skiage or Motewaza. I love this stuff. Now, talk about timing. You can see it really here. So cutting in eight directions. And then this, yeah, this is like, he had that movement in there that sometimes people copy.
Kodagai's Kokunage. Riminage. Kodagaish. Now this is where you see the timing in his position. He's in front of him, then he's behind him. That. He's in Toitsu Tai when he does that. That's a hard technique to do. Oops. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's O-Sensei in 1935. I think it's, I think it's amazing. When in the sword work, you can really see how deeply he enters, because you got to cover a lot of ground to enter deeply Boken against Boken, like in a Kumitachi. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, that's as good as it gets, guys. Um, the most of the movies of O Sensei are later in his life. There, I think there's a couple still of this period, but most of the ones he's very he's old, uh, much older, and um, like everybody else who was really a great teacher, he evolved, and you know things change over time. So uh, that's really at the period when Aikido probably was first being called Aikido, and probably. Be- at some point it changed from like Aiki Jiu-Jitsu or Aiki Budo uh, into Aikido. Um, and it sort of was a gradual process, I think, but it didn't even have maybe a, that distinct a name at that point. And uh, he had practiced all these other martial arts, uh, including uh, very importantly, Daito-ru and uh, the, the spear thing, the spear art. Um, anyway, uh, any questions on that? So now this is going to be fourth Q techniques. Shomenuchi Nikyo, or Motaiwaza. So remember, I, I've been showing like three ways to do uh, Shomenuchi Nikyo Ura lately. And that's sort of the, I think if I saw that right, that was the middle version. So that was the version where you, 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 you take the elbow right at the moment of contact, like sort of Ikyo Ura, but then you immediately slide down to the wrist. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, anybody have any uh, questions on that first part? So Yoko Munuchi Shihonage. So he's saying, don't do it like that, stepping forward into the UK. We talked about this last time, stepping back.
Uh, Shihanagi or Multandora questions? Okay. Riminage two ways. At that time, it was two ways. So he's doing Chokusen and Urawaza. So those were the two ways at that point. No, he's not doing Omote Waza, but later somehow it got added. Questions on Iriminage? Okay, at the end we'll we'll, can, we'll take questions again. So Shiro. Sankyo. Urawaza. Questions on Ushiro, was it Ushiro Takubitari, Sankyo? Sensei, I, uh, this is Pete. I had a quick question about Sankyo in general. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about when is it appropriate to cut down as as with the sword um boken yeah uh, on on sankyo and i have not observed that um here so i had a question just about when when would we apply that uh that kind of technique yeah that's that's a good question that's a um that's a hard part of sankyo uh to explain exactly um so um let's see um <laughs> Uh, all right, let's go back and watch this again. Hang on. Okay, so you push, then See, he's doing it the other way that time. That time he's turn, making the uke go back. So that's a, that's a different, a slight different variation. In that case, he never gets to the point where he would cut that way. See, once he starts turning them, he just switches to the Sankyo and just keeps it going. Uh, I want to put this back further to see more of the Omote. Okay, so so that one he's not doing the cutting down thing. He's do turning he's twisting the opposite way. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a good example to show it well here. Um, but right when he switched to the Sankyo right there, so he's, twist, he's twisting the wrist to the outside, and that just sort of puts pressure on the arm. So the arm is sort of in what feels like one piece all the way through the shoulder. So there, he was twisting the wrist there. You, it's hard to see. But, so, but that's, that's applying that principle in an Urawaza. This is hard to explain. Got it. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, I'm, not, I'll, I'm going to keep trying, though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, it's hard to see here, but basically um, on Omote Waza, the cut down could be you step in, you take Ikkyo, right? You switch to Sankyo, and then if you let them come up, if you let the UK come up instead of, I, I tend to now these days just stop the UK's elbow down there so the UK never gets up, right? But if you let the UK get up, as he sort of did in one of those, if you then cut down forward right there, twisting the wrist to the inside so the whole arm was locked. So you could feel when you did that, it felt like a bokken because you could feel, not that it's straight, but you could feel the arm in one piece going through the shoulder. And you could feel by cutting down, you would make his body go down. And that would be one application of that. Um, um, you could also do it on Urawaza, but um, so um, you, you apply that, so techniques have different like pieces or components to them. And in different variations, you might put in one component and take out another or more of one component and less of another. So I got to find an example, you know, where I can, where you can see exactly what you're talking about. Cause that is part of Sankyo. But I guess what I'm saying is you don't always apply it. Uh, it kind of depends. If you do a multiwaza, stop the UK's elbow so that he never gets up, and then you just do your tenkan step back, drive his shoulder down with your knee. You never get to the point where you're really doing that. Um, uh, uh, if you're doing urawaza, once you start, you know, doing like sort of a U-shaped step around him to the ura side, it, you're keeping twisting the arm again, to the inside, it's sort of like that. But again, you're not cutting forward like a sword strike. You're doing it to help you move him around. But it's the same idea that the, 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 swords, the, the, the sword strike thing is the same thing. The, the thing is you're, you're twisting the wrist to the inside so that when you cut down, wherever you do that, you feel his whole arm and his shoulder and his body. So uh, the way to do it wrong, you know, you grab the wrist and you're cutting down and there's all slack in his arm and nothing's happening to his body. That's how you know you're doing it wrong. So if you're twisting to the inside, then you cut down or whatever you do with his arm twisted to the inside so it's locked and you can move his body with that pressure on the wrist. That is the same principle as when you cut straight down. Got it, thank you, Sensei. Okay, I'll, um, I'll try to find a good example of what you're talking about so we can see it. Uh, anybody else? Sankyo, I think this changed a little bit because I see he's letting them up a little bit when he when he takes the Sankyo rather than just keeping them down. But I think that changed a little bit over time. So this is like around 1985 or something. Kodagash. That's pretty much exactly the same as we do it now. So he's saying, don't turn like that so you're close to him. You got to lock the wrist in there so he moves to your front as you do your 10 counter, whatever that last movement is.
So with Kodogash, it's a little bit of a problem when you sometimes when you do your ten con. Sometimes the UK is already down before you finish your ten con. So you, sometimes you don't do it because at least that's my explanation. I don't know if Barbara wants to comment here. This is uh, uh, a point we discuss, but uh, anyway, of course you're supposed to do a ten con when you throw. Um, but uh, I think he doesn't always do it. I think part of it is that. Uh, yeah, ten con was the form there, but it got he emphasized it, so it became more distinct. I think in later as time passed, but also I think sometimes the UK just is falling down before you can finish your ten con, or even you know really get much into it. Uh, questions on Kodagash? Okay. So he's saying, don't pull, push. So that was Nikio Urawaza. Now Omote now Ura. So there's the sort of one version of Sankyo again. So sorry was uh, uh, Sankyo. Any questions on that one? Okay. So Kokuho was not officially on the test, but for some reason, since they always made people do it on their fourth Q test. So he was saying the wrong way to have your body set up in the uh, when you pin. Uh, that was Barbara. Okay, so that was the um, fourth Q techniques. Um, yeah, so uh, Kokyu Ho, he always made people do that in fourth cue, so we do that too. Um, uh, one of the things I never asked him why he did that, but uh, and um, I think I think it was pretty close to what we're doing. Um, I think Sankyo is a little bit different, um, and um, I don't know. Any other questions?
Okay. Well, take out your Joe Cotto techniques. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, so uh, I know a lot of a lot of people have asked to go over the Joe Cotto again, and um, Chris Niskola has done us the favor of putting the technique names and subtitles on this on this uh, video. So if you go down to your, well, I'll do it. So I'm going to say. So they're going to show up down there. So now you don't have to look at your sheet because we've got the technique names there and the numbers. So um, we'll go through it that way. I'll, I'll count it off verbally as well. And then um, this is only like two minutes. So we'll go through it. And then if anybody wants to focus on certain parts, we can do that. Okay. So let's just look at the whole thing first. Chokuski. Harayage, call that Chokuski. Oh, that's one and two again. So Kyokuski, Skiage, Harayage. Then six, Zuju Gaishi, Yokomen, Yokomen, Ushiroski, Shomenuchi. Do. Okay, back to there, end of part one, 14. So then 15. All right. Kyokuski and two uh, Yokomans. Then. Zujo Zengo Ski. All right, and forward. Hosensei's secret technique. All right, 22, turn the Joe around, do, hit the ribs. So then repeating, 21, 22, oh, skip 23, okay, 24, knees down, hit the strike away, then pull the Joe back to hide it, sort of. And then 28, okay, so uh, 28 was the end of part two where uh, instead of uh, the like the dough that's number 13 on part one, in this case, you hit the knee instead of the ribs. Um, and then uh, 28 is going back to the ready position again. Uh, and then we start the, uh, the, four, the third part. I'm just going to back it up a little bit. Uh, okay, so now we're on the third part. So there's now starting in at 29. 30, 40 ski, 31, Toma ski. Then it's a step forward and another step forward. And that Oi ski. All right. Big strike to the knee, cover your head. Shomenuchi to the left. It's sort of like uh, some uh, Ushiro ski, and then Hasso is that position. So that's where it finishes. Now again, um, the um, uh, I'm going to go back to that. Um, hang on one second. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So. At the end, it goes fast. So I don't know if you want to, or do, uh, do you have questions or is there anything you want to see again? Sensei, at, at 31, um, what was the, uh, can I Sensei's feet, feet position? Uh, <laughs> hang on, let me just see something. There were two strikes. 31, there. Toma Ski. Okay. So the, the, that's part three. So it starts out Kyoku Ski, right, which is the, you know, the most common ski, right? Mm -hmm. And then Fori ski is retreating and underneath. It's a ski coming up from under, somewhat like a skiage. And in that case, the end of the Joe winds up in your right elbow. Is that right? No, in your left elbow. Uh, and then Toma ski is step forward and the back foot comes to the right foot. And at 31, and your feet are to come together. Okay. 
and uh, and you you kind of like go up on the balls of feet, and so that's just a way of stretching further forward. Um, let's see if we can see that again. There, let's go before that. Uh, okay, so twenty nine. Four ski, right? And then see so back foot to front foot and then feet are together. So they're together. Okay, so yeah. thank you. Step forward. And this is big step forward, and then you turn your hip for power. Pull. Pull your back hand. Yep. Hit the knee. Shomanuchi. Ushiro Skiri, uh, gotta check that one out. And Hasso. So Tomo Ski, yeah, your feet are together, the toes are pointed out. Um, and uh, weight would be on the ball of your foot. Thank you, Sensei. Yep. Welcome. Um, any, anything else, any other questions or parts you wanna look at again? It does go a little fast at the end. We we uh, we picked out the one we thought was the best, just so we could put the um, the names on it. But uh, there's a couple other versions we have, so maybe we'll find a better one, or maybe we'll be able to do some kind of edit. Uh, so we have we spend a little more time in the last part. It kind of jumps there into the third part, um, and then it happens pretty fast. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll keep working on that. We're also still working on the written sheet. If you have it from last time, we're gonna do another revision that we'll publish uh, probably after the session sometime, just minor things like some things where it said right instead of left and stuff like that. Um, so um, uh, yeah, and again, caveats are, um, you can do this facing one direction, uh, especially when you start and then add the changing directions uh, afterward. Um, also, there's several versions of where you change directions. Um, and um, there's also some variations in some of the techniques a little bit like um, the first Ushiro ski in the first part. Uh, you know, on the sheet, it said it says, uh, I think Ushiro ski. Yeah. But the way he did it, it didn't really look like a ski. It looked more like what I call a transitional movement. So it's a way to move your Joe around, put it in position for the next movement. So uh, an Ushiro ski kind of movement could be either thing, depending on how much power you put into it and whether you're, whether you're hitting something or not. Um, and a lot of the Joe is, um, you know, moving it around. And so you're, you're kind of thinking a move in advance in a way, because you're, you're always thinking about, you know, if you want to do something, is there some other position that you want to go through in order to most efficiently get to the position to strike rather than just going for the strike? Um, so the Joe is also very free and ambidextrous. So um, it lends itself to that kind of transitional positions and moving it around. Um, you, the strikes can go different ways. Like the first uh, Shomanuchi, um, like in part one, uh, he calls it Gyakute Shomanuchi. I think that's because your front hand on the Shomanuchi is sort of the pinky is forward and the, th and the thumb and forefinger to your back. Whereas you could do Shomanuchi the regular way you would do with a sword, which would be your thumb and forefinger would be forward. And that would probably be uh, considered um, Shomanuchi. And then Gyakute Shomanuchi is your hand is this other way that it is in this jokata, and that it can sometimes be. You can do shomanuchi that way with a jo, not with a, not with a sword, not with a boken, right? Because that's blade on a boken. But uh, in other words, uh, with a jo, you, you could do shomanuchi with your hands in somewhat different positions. Um, and and uh, similarly uh, with yokoman, your hands could be in different positions. So. Uh, not all of them have names, but uh, with a Joe especially, you just have to be aware there's a lot of flexibility in the parts and, and, and there's sort of different configurations that you could go through. You know, I guess the other thing to point out is that a, a Joe Kata is, uh, you know, someone's taken the time to logically put together a series of techniques um, in, in, a, in a sequence. 
And it's not like it's magic or anything. And there are many jokatas that different teachers have developed. So, you know, there's no magic kata. It's just how, how much intelligence and understanding went into the construction of it that sort of separates good katas from bad katas. But uh, there's lots of katas and lots of variations of the katas that there are. Well, I see by the clock on the wall that it's uh, 7.30. Um, we really didn't get as far. So, uh, how long is this thing? Um, oh, no, not that. Uh, okay, so this is a minute and 20 seconds. So let's just look at this. It's just a Kumi Joe, and you can see it's based on part of the kata. It's just a little bit. I'm putting together the whole thing so you can see the whole thing, but this is a preview. So that's Choku Ski, number one. Harayage, but hitting the Joe away, using it to hit the Joe away. The UK comes Kyoku Ski. And he does coke, he's going to do Kyoku ski as well. So the UK comes on an angle trying to make a good attack, and the Nage still takes another angle to evade his strike and still hit him. And then Skiage, number four, number five. So uh, we'll, we'll just stop there, but I'm going to put together the whole uh, Kumi Joe so eventually we can see the, uh, another, the other side of the kata. And so that's how you turn a, a kata into a Kumi, uh, Kumi Joe. And again, uh, there's different, you could do it different ways. Um, and Sensei, in fact, I think changed these Kumi Joe a number of times. Um, but it's sort of just constructing, uh, extrapolating to the other side of the thing. And I just thought it's good so you can see, at least for the first few movements, how the application might be uh, against a, a Nuke also with a Joe. So, um, so the plan is uh, next week to um, basically, I don't know, I'll find another kind of fun video of maybe O-sensei or something, or just like some good, interesting things to start with. And then we'll go on, I guess, to third queue. Anybody has questions on fourth or fifth queue, we can go back. Um, we'll probably continue going over the Jokata for a while. Please, if you want to make a video of yourself doing the Jokata and submit it for, uh, for feedback uh, that can be done either uh, privately or publicly, depending on your degree of masochism. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, either way, you know, please do that. Feel free. And if, you know, if, again, if you have questions or about any of this, uh, feel free to email them as well. Um, Thank you, Sensei. Uh, yeah. And so uh, anything... Anything, any, and also let me know if there's, if you ever see any videos you want to look at that you think would be interesting to go over. Sensei, can I make my uh, annual, annual request for rendezvous with adventure, please? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I actually, that's a good idea. We will do that for our fun thing next time. Rendezvous with adventure is this TV, American TV show that was made in the fifties where, these two guys kind of bumbled their way around the globe in search of adventure. And uh, as part of their adventure in Japan, they spent about, uh, well, it's a 15 minute segment, but they spent a little time in Hambu Dojo and got some private lessons from O-sensei and Koichi Tohei, who was the chief instructor at that time. So it's pretty funny because it's, uh, it's really like uh, America 1950s mentality 
uh, arrives at Ike in Ambudojo, you know, so it's, it, it's pretty funny. And uh, so rendezvous with adventure. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. Anything else? All right. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, please send in your feedback. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sensei. 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 Thank you, Sensei.